Hello everyone, <laughs> I'm here with Gavin, oh, is, is it Gavin Verhey? Did I say it right? Verhey, yeah, that's absolutely right. You nailed it. Well done. Most people <laughs> say like Verhey or something like that and you got it absolutely correct. Um, uh, I, I, we, we actually never like talked before in person or whatever, but um, I, I, I've uh, made some research on, on the internet. You actually have a Wikipedia page of your own. Um, so if the, if, if the information is correct, you're the senior uh, game design, uh, game de game design manager or something like that. I at Wizards. You also have a column on Daily MTG, and overall, just uh, just a known personality in Magic. Uh, so I thought it would be interesting to talk to you today. How is it going? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank it's going great. Thank you. I mean, you know, over here in the states, everyone is still on lockdown, or at least here in Seattle, anyway, everyone is still on lockdown. But uh, it's going good. I've been able to do a lot of cool stuff from my home, so that's really nice. Um, you know, uh, over the past year, I've started up my own YouTube channel called oh, Good right. Morning Magic. So that's when, yeah, that's been keeping me really busy making a lot of YouTube videos. I make three videos a week, so it's like a wow. lot of work to stay on top of. And then uh, also just designing lots of magic cards from home. You know, my job is basically, there's a lot of fancy words that go in my job title. But the <laughs> basis of my job is that uh, I design magic cards for new sets. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a, a new set comes out. I've usually touched it in some way or another, whether giving feedback on it, designing cards for it, play testing it, and uh, so on. And this will be, 2021 will be my 10th year at Wizards of the Coast. Oh, so uh, hard to believe I've been here for 10 years now, but uh, pretty wild. Then before that, I was a pro Magic player. So uh, yeah. Oh, I actually uh, didn't, I actually didn't know that. 10 years at Wizards, pro Magic player for a while, and uh, this year is also my 20th year playing Magic. So, 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 so you, you mentioned the fact that you make a lot of YouTube videos. I wanted to get to that later, but because you mentioned it, uh, maybe you can talk about it a little bit. Um, you know, how long are you, you, you said you started doing it like a couple of weeks back. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. So I started doing it in quarantine. So mm -hmm. I started doing it all the way back in March. So about, wow, hard to believe it'll be uh, oh, 10 yeah. months. And, uh, so. I was locked up at home and I had thought for a long time about doing some kind of video show. I thought that could be really interesting and fun, but I was so busy. I just didn't have the time for it. Right. When was I going to have enough time to actually work on this by myself? Well, it turns out that being stuck inside all day is pretty good for that happening. Um, and so I, um, I started making it during quarantine. Yeah. I've been doing it for, I guess yeah, about 10 months now or so. And uh, you know, that's grown, it's grown really, really well. And there's a lot of people watching the channel. And it's been really cool to talk with all the players. You know, a big part of Magic for me is being able to talk with all of the community. And I'm so glad this has been an extra way of making that happen. Mm -hmm. Why did you Why did you decide, decide to start to do that? Did you just wanted to maybe promote yourself or you just wanted to get more people into Magic? Like, what, what, what were the reasons? Yeah, I mean, for me, like... The community is such a huge part of magic you know i grew up a, as a magic player i started playing when i was 10 years old i've been involved in the community my entire life more or less since i started playing and um, i never want to lose that connection and so the great thing about making videos is it means every week i'm talking to people and if it's not you know on social media on twitter or something like that uh it's on youtube and it means that i always have the opportunity to talk with people and get their thoughts and um I love, I, I love being able to do that and uh, stay connected with the game that I love so much, especially right now, because we're all at home, right? Or so many of us are at home. It lets me talk with people who I would not be able to talk with otherwise and get their thoughts and opinions. So it's mm -hmm. been really valuable um, for me to stay in touch with the community and it's made, made me happy. And it's also made our sets better by me being able to hear about what other folks are doing. Mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned the fact that you used to be a professional magic player. I actually didn't, didn't know that. Uh, that that's awesome. Um, how, how, how did you start with, with magic? Was it just that, you, you know, someone, someone brought it to school and you started playing? How did that happen? Yeah, so I started when I was 10 years old. So that would be, I'm 30 now. So that was 20 years ago. And um, I just, uh, I was at a Wizards of the Coast game store. So back in the day, their Wizards of the Coast used to have game stores like mm -hmm. actually named Wizards of the Coast that you would go into. And uh, I was just there with my mom and my brother. And uh, the person behind the counter recommended magic to us. And uh, I, my, mom, my mom asked me 
if, hey, Gavin, do you think you would like this? And I thought for a second, and what I didn't know is at that time, that might very well be the most important decision I was going to make in my entire life. I had <laughs> no idea, right? Um, but I said yes, and I brought it home, and I learned how to play, and I taught my brother. And um, we spent you know, all year just playing Magic with each other and totally getting hooked. And then uh, when I was 11 you know, years old, um, about a year later, I decided I wanted to work for Wizards. And so I spent basically 10 years of my life, starting at 11, trying to figure out how I could get a job at Wizards. And um, so I dedicated myself very early to uh, getting to where that's, I am That's today. crazy that you just like knew it all along. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the, it's, it's the thing that's my spark. It's the thing that I care mm -hmm. about so much. And I love this game. I love the players. And I love being a part of making it happen. So you said that you're 30. You, you work at Wizards for 10 years and you've been a professional player like even before that. That means that you had to be a pro at like 18 or something. Is that correct? Yeah, the first pro tour I qualified for, I was 15. Oh, um, that's impressive. So yeah, that was the f first time I qualified, I was 15. And then I got hired by Wizards when I was 21. So I used Magic to help pay for college. Because mm -hmm. uh, over here in the States, it's quite expensive. And then uh, after graduating, I was pretty quickly hired to pick up, uh, hired into Wizards. What's the reason that you that you went pro just because you thought that it would like get you closer to your like dream job or what happened there? Like, like yeah, yeah. I'm it, sorry. That's a really good question. Yeah. No, no, it's it's a really good question. So uh, I'll tell you exactly what happened. So like I said, when I was 11, I decided I w I wanted to go work for Wizards. Mm -hmm. And I went to a local event. It was a local pre-release. And back in 2001, it was a very different time. And the way that pre-releases worked is they were, instead of being at stores, they were one big location. So you would go to like, you know, a huge place downtown in your city, and there'd be hundreds of people there all playing the pre-release together. And as a result, the Wizards employees would go to the pre-releases. And so I went to one such pre-release. And Randy Bueller was there, mm -hmm. and Randy was the uh, VP of R and D at the time, so he helped run the show. For people who don't know, Randy and Bueller, I was I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, Randy Bueller used to be like uh, one of the biggest commentators at, at Pro Tours and stuff. Just for people who don't know, I just wanted to. Absolutely, yeah. yeah he was well, he, so he had commentary for a long time, mm -hmm. but before that, he actually ran R and D and made Magic, and then before that, he was a pro player. Mm -hmm. So he has a very long history with Magic, not unlike myself, I suppose, and. Uh, so he, he was there, and I was 11 years old, and I went up to him, and I said, hey, Randy, um, how can I get a job working at Wizards? And he took me really seriously, right? I was 11 years old, and he looked at me, and he said, okay, you're going to need two things. The first thing you're going to need is a college degree. And my heart just sinks, right? Because I'm 11 years old. It's going to take forever to get one of those. Oh, my gosh, it's going to take ages. Uh, but the second thing he says is you should be a really good player because we like to hire people who know magic really well. And of course, I thought, well, I don't know about this whole college degree thing, but a pro magic player, that's got to be easy. <laughs> so I um, so from that moment forward, I dedicated myself to going pro. And yeah, so I qualified for my first pro tour when I was 15. I actually I started college when I was 16, which is about two years earlier than most people started um, here in the States. And uh, I graduated by the time I was 20 um, and I played, you know, played pro magic. So that's kind of my trajectory. And I really dedicated myself to making it happen and just devoured all information I could about the game. Do you do you do you ever think about like going back and just prove that you can be one of the best? Is is, is that something on your mind, or was it just like really a way to to get a job, but you never really cared about that that much? No, I mean the hardest part of me of working at Wizards is not being allowed to go play in big tournaments because I love competing. I love it so much. I love playing, and you know you're sitting in a match and there's this pressure on you. And, um, you know, like it's only you and your opponent. There might be a thousand people in the room, but for that moment, it is you and your opponent right, <laughs> locked in combat. You know, I, I was, I don't know if you watched it, but I was watching The Queen's Gambit recently. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, this, it's this new show on Netflix, which is about competitive chess. And it just like encapsulated this so well for me. Um, and so, uh, no, I miss it very much. But the one downside of working at Wizards really is that I can't, I'm not allowed to go play mm -hmm. in big tournaments anymore. So I can't do that. But that said, I still fly out to um, Magic Fest back, you know, not right now, of course, with COVID. But before COVID, I would fly out to Magic Fest all the time. I went to the World Championship last year to see friends. So I'm still often there in the room talking with the friends I have and watching the game being played, even if I can't play in the big tournaments myself. 
Yeah, I actually been to a couple of Magic Fests where you attended. You often uh, answer like people's questions and stuff like that. Um, it's yeah. Your, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's from your like experience. That, like, I usually I, I'm very competitive uh, Magic player, so I don't really interact with like maybe all Magic players. You know, I go to like Magic Fest and stuff. Um, when you interact with those people at Magic Fest, do you feel that maybe those people are like different than the people uh, on your like YouTube channel? They like ask different questions and stuff like that. I mean, can can you just talk about it a little bit if you can? Yeah, totally. I mean, there are so many different kinds of Magic players. We talk about Magic as though it's one game, mm -hmm. but really, Magic is like a hundred games, and different things matter to different people, right? You have people who love Standard, people who love Modern. People who only play limited, people who play commander, people who care about the story, people who don't who don't care about the story. You have cosplayers, you have historians, you know, you have commentators. There are so many kinds of people, and they're all involved with magic. But magic means a different thing to every single one. Of them. Uh -huh. And so when I travel and go to different places or talk to people on on social media or wherever, I'll talk to very different people, right? And so if I go to a tournament and I ask people playing in a magic fest, you know, playing in a, in the Grand Prix event at a magic fest about magic. They're probably going to be pretty competitive players, right? They're going to be like yourself, and they're going to ask me um, a lot of questions about them. Um, but on the flip side, if I go to a Command Fest event or ask players who only play Commander, I might get entirely different answers. And so knowing who you're talking to and taking their feedback in is going to be really important for the kinds of um, for the kinds of things that you're thinking about. And so yes, I definitely do think about different things depending on the person I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. There is a command fest. That's like a f first time I've heard that term. Um, it's like a it's like a it's like a Grand Prix, but just for like commander players or like what is it? Yeah, so we started doing command fest last, or I guess uh, in 2019, mm -hmm. we ran command fest, which is just a big commander uh, weekend event. And so um, you know, it's three days long, and people can come on in and play commander. And there's all the stuff you would expect at a Magic fest, but it's entirely commander themed. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we weren't able to continue the program into 2020 because COVID, people couldn't gather in person. Um, but we have run some ones online using Webcam Commander. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with this or not, but a lot I've of people are playing about it, right yeah. now with the webcam. Yeah. So there's been some online Command Fest, which are really cool. And my hope is that after you know COVID subsides and we're able to go meet in person again, you will see uh, more Command Fest in the future. I don't actually know if you can influence such a decision, but do you think that we will ever see a tournament like maybe Grand Prix uh, in Commander? Like, like you know, um, just a tournament with, with Commander, but people can maybe qualify for the Pro Tour or, you know, something like that. Do, do you think that that's conceivable? Maybe do you think it's going to, going to happen? You know, I get asked this question a lot. It, it's a good question. And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is uh, com Commander is um, really a fun social format not we are not trying to make it a competitive format now i know there are places where it is played competitively mm -hmm. and in fact especially over in europe there's definitely one-on-one -on -one commander and things like that that happen but on the whole the vast majority of commander like you know 95 plus percent is played as social casual commander yeah. and um the moment that you start putting stakes on it like a you know a qualification to the highest level play of magic you start to ruin that fun element a little bit. So no, I don't think you would expect to see any mm -hmm. kind of competitive commander in the future. If you want to play a competitive commander, that's great. I mean, I actually personally even enjoy competitive commander, but it's not the default way to play, and uh, I would not expect there to be any big tournaments for it. Mm -hmm. It's a good question, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would really enjoy playing it, but as, as I said, I mostly focus on the competitive side of Magic, so I never really get to do that, so that's why I wanted to ask about it, but what you're saying makes sense. Um, yeah. Uh, what I want, want want to ask about next is your uh, work at uh, as, a, as, as a game designer. I don't actually get to talk to someone like that very often, so I'm very interested in, you know, you, you want to create a set, so like, how does the process uh, happen? Like, do you, do you first just like figure out the basis, or maybe you, you first figure out the lore, and then you like try to fit the cards in? I just have basically no idea, so if you can maybe talk about how the, how the set uh, gets to gets to happen, that would be great. Yeah, totally. So it is a very long, very complicated process. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't realize this, but it takes years oh, to really? make a magic set. Yeah. Um, so for example, Kaldheim, which is releasing right about now as we're recording, 
we started working on Kaldheim in I think I think it was 2017. It's about four years ago. Um, so man, man, I think it was late 2017. I, I don't have to check. Maybe it's more like 2018. But anyway, it doesn't it's been matter. a very long, it's a long time. Yeah, a long time. Yeah, and because there's so much that has to happen, and that's all before you can start making the cards to get them out to people all around the world, right? Um, and so what first happens is this very long segment of time called exploratory design. And in exploratory design, we're basically testing out um, the world. Like we might be told we're doing a Norse themed world. And that's okay. Let's try and make a lot of mechanics that fit the idea of that. Let's make sure that it works. It's a proof of concept. Then after several months of that, we move into the uh, design phase, the vision design phase where we actually start making the set. So all that stuff we did for the first several months is just testing for when we actually start making the set to make sure that it's going to work. So then we um, start making cards for the set, locking down mechanics, figuring out what's going, that kind of stuff. That'll take another four or five months, sometimes six months. And then after that, we hand it off to another team, which is the, the play design team and the final design team set design team and they will refine it right they'll get it all game balanced they will make sure the limited environment works they'll change it and it needs to get changed and that takes another long slew of months after that is finished we hand it off to an editing team and they edit all the cards make sure that they look appropriate right that they um you know that they have all the uh, right words on them at the same time all of this is happening there's a huge creative team that is um naming the cards giving them flavor text all that kind of stuff so um there is, it's a very long process. It takes a very long time. And uh, one of the hardest things about my job actually is knowing how far along I am and how long it will be until stuff that I'm working on now that you will see. For example, literally right, right before this call, I was in a play test for a set you won't see until 2022 or uh, sorry, 2023. And so um, it's just, it takes a long time for this stuff to come out. Um, and even though I'm very excited about a set like Call Time, which is really cool, there's also a part in my head that's like, yeah, but Kaldheim is old news. Like, wait till you check out the, the next thing coming out. And uh, it, it just takes a really long time. That's very interesting for me to hear that it takes like several years to create it because we have like new set coming uh, every three months. So either you have like multiple teams working on like different sets or you work on multiple sets at the same time or otherwise you just wouldn't be able to produce as many sets, right? Yeah, uh, both those things are true. So we everyone works on multiple sets at the same time, pretty much. The norm uh, for any individual person is to be on about three sets at a time. And, you know, for reference, there's about, well, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I think there's about 40 different designers who are working on designing sets. So we have a lot of different designers working on the building um, uh, just for game design. Um, and it's weird for me because as a player, like for you, you experience magic in a very linear order. It happens one at a time, right? It's uh, Zendikar comes out, then Commander Legends comes out, then Call Time comes out, and just, you know, this, this very strict order that happens. To me, I will bounce between different years in the same day. So I'll go from a, a 2021 set into a 2022 set, back into a 2021 set, have a discussion about a 2024 set, whatever, all, like, all within the same day. So I'm constantly time traveling around different sets, and um, because all sets are changing, um, you have to keep them all in your head, right? So it's like, oh, maybe we're going to change this thing in this 2022 set. Because does it, this does thing it in ever mix up in your head? Uh, it can, yeah, yeah, <laughs> quite often. So uh, you have to keep that in mind. Especially, um, there's the one that always will stick with me is I worked on Cons of Tarkir block mm -hmm. a lot. And that was a very confusing block to work on because of all the time travel stuff going on. You were never, it's like, was this card in the middle set, in the past, or in the present, or in the alternate present? And you can never really remember. So it takes a very long time, and uh, it's very easy to get it mixed up. So uh, fortunately, I've done it for long enough that I know it, but even new people who have come in and worked here for a year still get confused sometimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's quite the process. Another thing that I would like to ask about the sets is that you know, from from my point 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 of view, a new set comes out, and maybe we have like a standard format, and it's not necessarily balanced, uh, or whatever. But that might not be like the main focus of your team. Maybe you're making the set more for like the more casual players. I don't actually really know. So when you're designing the set, like what what is your actually like your target audience? Do you just want to, want to make it like the most interesting for like the people who are maybe playing like FNMs or maybe home with their kids? 
or are you like trying to make a format format that's like you know balanced and fun to play for for the m- m- more of the competitive players like PD kill players and stuff like that um can you just talk about it a little bit if you can yeah totally so as i mentioned earlier one of the tricks of magic is it is so many different mm-hmm. games all in one right and because of that when we make a new big set like one of our huge releases like call time or something it's for a lot of different people and we have to make sure all those things are right now with a set like say a commander deck it's a different story a commander deck is clearly for commander players yeah so that's what we're going to focus on but with a set like Kaldheim, it's kind of for everybody and so we have to make sure that the draft environment is good we have to make sure that the standard environment is good we put a <laughs> lot of time so much time into testing standard and draft but we also care about modern and legacy so what's going to happen in those in those formats we care a lot about the, the player at home who's playing kitchen table magic whether it's commander or a different format and how they're going to receive the cards so we look at all these things, and we have to consider all of them when making a magic set. So there's a lot, the prime, the, the most of the testing, most of the testing happens for standard and limited. So draft. Yeah. But there's also plenty that happens for modern legacy commander. And um, it's, it's a lot. Um, so to get the set right takes a lot of finesse and a lot of playtesting and work, which is part of why it takes so long to make. Can you usually predict how, how the best standard decks are going to look like? Or are you often like very off and you're like very surprised what the players came up with? I would say that, I mean, sometimes we do. Definitely sometimes we do, especially when they're built around a theme. So it's kind mm-hmm. of obvious, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. you're building a deck that's all an enchantment deck, right? Okay, that makes sense. Um, I would say that we're very good normally at identifying what cards are going to get played. But we are not always as good as getting like the decks exactly correct. So um, we, we usually know what the strong cards will be for the most part by getting the exact deck list right. I mean, ultimately, you know, there's 40 of us in a room trying to make this happen um, with, with the card design. And there's 20 million Magic players or more. So uh, we're, yeah, we're going to yeah. get beat by the 20 million Magic players. Um, but uh, we can, I, I try and get the cards right, the individual cards correct as well as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, we've recently seen Magic Arena came to existence. Did that play an influence on how you create cards? Because n- nowadays we get like infinite matches played every day. Um, the games are more faster. The formats are getting sold faster and faster. Did that have like any influence or is it just the same? So as far as like our general feeling about Magic, um, no, it hasn't changed it that much Mm -hmm. but it has done uh there are two things that have come out of it that i think are worth noting the first is just all of the data right we now see all these games being played and so that means we can just collect data from them even quicker and we can learn things like what are the most popular cards to craft right what cards the players want to craft on arena the most uh we can see in limited which archetypes have the best uh, draft records so we can learn a lot from that the second thing that we do is um because arena is mostly best of one you can play best of three, but most of the time you're playing best of one matches as opposed to traditional magic, which is best of three matches. What that means is uh, we have designed a few cards with best of one in mind. For example, you might have noticed that uh, for the past several sets, there have been a few more modal cards, cards that say like do X or Y. Mm-hmm. So maybe destroy an enchantment or an artifact or exile card in a graveyard, things like that. Um, we've made more of these so that you just have extra flexibility so that you have the opportunity to destroy an enchantment when you're building your deck. Because traditionally, you would put your enchantment removal or artifact removal in your sideboard. But when you don't have a sideboard, well, we made a few more of those cards. Um, We also have up effects like looting a little bit, where you draw a card and then discard a card. Because that also gives you a way to put these cards into your main deck. But then if they don't have an artifact or enchantment, you can draw it and discard it away. I see. Um, So there's a few tiny things we have done. um, But on the whole, it hasn't impacted us too much. That said, who knows what we might do in the future. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, last thing that I want to ask about, uh, it, it's kind of random, but um, I think a couple of years back, Wizards announced that they're going, going to make uh, like a TV series on Netflix or something. Um, is that just not happening? Do you know anything about it? I just wanted to ask about you because you are very insightful in this kind of a stuff. So I just wanted to take my chance, basically. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it's super exciting announcement. I remember when the, the announcement came out, I was stoked. Mm-hmm. I, I know that we're still excited about it. You know, a lot of people are still stoked about it. I don't work on that side, though, so I truly don't know anything. And especially right now, working from home. You know, it used to be when I was in the office, I would hear a lot about all the things that were happening all the time. But now, you know, I'm not talking with different people as often. So 
I don't know any more information about it, but um, I think it'll happen someday, and I'll be very excited when it does. Oh, so you you still think it will happen? It's not like it just like disappeared. Uh, I mean, as as far you, as you I know, know, but I also yeah. I haven't been I haven't been part of the discussions at all. So it very well mm -hmm. there very well could have been a change, and I might not have heard about it. So um, I get really 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 can't say one way or another. But I'm hopeful, if nothing else, that it will happen because I think it'll be very cool. Okay. Well, thank you, Gavin. It was fun talking to you today. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, if you guys like the video, please click on the like and the subscribe button. And see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank thanks. you so much. Yeah.